Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself. Now joining us again in the studio is Gerald Horn. He's the author of The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the USA, and about 30 other books. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So we're, we're going to jump ahead now. Um, uh, you've said you're going to come back and we'll be able to do more of this history in more detail. <clears throat> but let's kind of make the leap to the Civil War. Uh, as you've argued earlier, much of the construction of capitalism in the United States is, is based on these massive profits that were developed in the slave trade. Uh, the revolution of 1776, you would call a counter-revolution revolution in a sense that it was uh, to maintain the institution of slavery. But that starts to change uh, as capitalism develops, particularly in the Northeast. Uh, why, why can't industrial capitalism in the Northeast accommodate slave society in the South? Why couldn't they get along? It's a good question. It requires a complicated answer. One is that after the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, it gives a jolt of, of adrenaline to the movement to abolish slavery. It helps to encourage London in particular to start moving away hesitantly and reluctantly from slavery, not least because of Haiti's proximity to their cash cow that is Jamaica. And like revolutions before and since, the Haitian revolutionaries were interested in spreading their gospel throughout the hemisphere, not least in neighboring Jamaica. So once again, uh, Britain is faced with the prospect of either a helter-skelter retreat from uh, slavery towards abolition, or a measured retreat, which of course takes place 1833, 1834 with abolition uh, throughout, the, throughout the empire. Secondly, U.S. leaders used to argue that uh, Britain, in a sense, was jealous of the United States because the U.S. leaders thought that the U.S. Had, was beginning to exceed Britain because it was more adept at the slave trade. It had a larger land mass. For example, after Britain lost the 13 colonies, it lost a major market for enslaved Africans. The U.S. nationals could then build upon that market to then expand into Cuba, expand into Brazil, et cetera. And from their point of view, Britain was moving away from slavery not because of morality and the campaigns of William Wilberforce and all the rest, but because it was just being squeezed out of a market and therefore it then ascended the high ground of moralism and uh, equipped the Royal Navy to stop U.S. ships on the open seas, which leads to further conflict with Washington, with the United States, over the question of slavery. And a, uh, in a previous book, I made the argument that uh, it's British abolition and the strength of British abolition for whatever reason, whether motivated by economics or moralism or a combination of the two, that puts enormous pressure on the United States to move away from slavery because the abolitionist movement, the movement to abolish slavery in the United States was heavily dependent, both politically and financially, and from a point of view of obtaining simple arguments, they were dependent upon their counterparts in London. And then there's the question of uh, whether or not slavery was becoming a fetter on the productive forces of the United States of America. As you've already noted, even though slavery was profitable, uh, questions were beginning to arise whether or not the United States could become even more profitable without slavery, not least because slaves oftentimes to, tended to destroy the instruments that they were working with. And keep in mind that slaves were not just deployed in the fields in Virginia, they were deployed in factories, they were deployed in mines, et cetera. But if they're destroying the, the enterprise that they're working in, questions are raised about a profitability. And then there's the idea that under slavery, that uh, you're shrinking a market. That is to say, if, if you have wage workers and you pay them money, then you can get it back by forcing them onto the market to buy food, uh, to get housing, et cetera. Whereas, you, also, you also can't fire a slave. I mean, it's a big, you know, if a slave doesn't work very hard in your factory, what are you going to do except terrorize the person? You terrorize the person, you sell them down the river, you know, you sell them to Cuba. <laughs> I mean, but, but in any case, that's not, oftentimes that's not very practical. 
So there are many forces that are pushing the United States towards abolition, but not necessarily pushing the United States towards anti-racism. I think that's oftentimes confused. That is to say, the U.S. Civil War is oftentimes seen as not only a war against slavery, and even that's questionable. But it wasn't a war against whiteness. To put it mildly, it wasn't a war in favor of anti-racism, as suggested by the fact that in New York City, in the middle of the Civil War, 1863, you had these so-called anti-draft riots that are portrayed in the movie by Martin Scorsese with Leonardo DiCaprio, the um, gangs of New York which is a remarkable scenes, if, if you've seen that movie of, of anti-black racism, and people being immolated and burned at the stake and lynched from lamp poles, et cetera, et cetera. This is in New York City. Uh, this is not in, in the Deep South. So the Civil War, as we well know, fortunately, <laughs> uh, leads to the liberation of enslaved Africans, uh, but it leads directly into the construction of a then Jim Crow regime, that is to say an apartheid regime a segregated regime, uh, which then do only erodes beginning in the 1950s under enormous international pressure, which is when I come into the story in St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> which is where we started. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's go back to the Civil War period more, though. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I, from what I understand, and my understanding is pretty thin about this period, but that part of the issue was that the, this need for uh, wage labor in the North that elite was also contending with the very powerful elite in the South, which actually may have even had more power over American national politics than even the Northerners did, even though the Northerners represented the kind of new productive forces that were exploding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it, it, it's, it's even more complicated than that in a sense, because as already noted, the slave trade itself was financed from places like New York. I should also mention that Baltimore was an epicenter of the uh, slave trade. There was a firm in Baltimore, which I mentioned in my book, The Deepest South, the United States, Brazil, and the African Slave Trade, uh, that can take major responsibility or discredit, depending on how you look at it, for the fact that there are so many people of African descent in Brazil right now. So you had forces in the North. Just to add to the Baltimore story, just about, about four or five minutes from here, Fells Point, uh, I've seen pictures where there are actual storefronts where there was a, a, a point where um, uh, even though Maryland was a slave state, if, I, if I'm correct in my understanding, the majority of blacks in Maryland were actually free blacks, and, uh, but that there was such a need at, at a certain point for slave labor that they had storefronts where people could come and sell their slaves. At, to these stores that were then shipped down to the to the south, and that there's a lot of kidnappings. So that movie, yeah. Twelve Years a Slave, where they would yeah. kidnap these f free blacks in Maryland and sell them into these stores down south. That was a real problem, the, the uh, kidnapping of, of free Africans. Not only kidnapping of, of free Africans, but say if uh, Britain was heavily dependent upon uh, Negroes in, in terms of their fleets, their commercial fleets, and so in terms of trading with the United States when they were coming into U.S. ports, say Charleston, for example. Oftentimes in Charleston, South Carolina, there were laws passed that would try to keep these free Negroes from getting off British ships to come into Charleston because it was thought that they set a bad example because you know, they had money, oftentimes you know, they were free individuals and that was seen as a bad example. But if they had the temerity to get off the ship nonetheless, they could be kidnapped and wind up working in a field in, in Louisiana sooner rather than later. And this is part of the tension between London and Washington that continues after 1776. In fact, uh, if I'm allowed to mention the, the dates, uh, in a few weeks from now, in August 2014, there would be uh, the 200th anniversary of a remarkable historical episode, I don't, although I don't think it'll be marked in most of the mainstream media. I just pitched the idea to one of your producers. And that is to say that in August, 2000, August 1814, during the War of 1812, which, by the way, was marked ceremoniously in Canada, but somehow was not marked here because part of the purpose of the War of 1812 was for the United States to seize Canada. Yeah, well, Canadians tend to rightly or wrongly think of that as some, the, the one real victory other than, <laughs> other than world hockey over the United States. So. <laughs> well, they have a point. And one of the reasons the United States went to seize Canada was because Canada had become a sanctuary for fleeing Africans and uh, London was not allowing the return 
of these of this property, this runaway capital, to the United States of America. But in any event, August 1814, during the War of 1812, uh, the Redcoats sack and plunder Washington, including the White House. And which burned, burned down the White House. Yeah. Absolutely they did. And in an early form of reparations for enslavement, they were joined by enslaved Africans in Washington, D.C., who were st stealing the dishes and the silver, et cetera. As the five-foot-four-inch five uh, bookish president, uh, James Madison, fled into the streets of Washington with his gregarious spouse, Dolly, in tow, one step ahead of the posse, <laughs> that is to say the Negroes fleeing after them, trying to catch them and exact some revenge. I don't think that's going to be marked uh, in the United States, although it's a heroic episode in, in black history. Uh, whenever I tell a black audience about that, I can, I can see the, the glow on their faces. Because, you know, the, the way this history is portrayed in the United States, either the black people are absent or they're chumps. <laughs> that is to say, either they're not there or they're just doing whatever the master tells them to do, uh, like some sort of robot or something. And, and because if you tell the real story, it, it's inimical to the glorious, uplifting, propagandistic narrative that is so prevalent nowadays. Okay, in the, in the next and final segment of this series of interviews, we're going to talk about, again, today, and how the, this history weighs on people's minds today, how whiteness uh, was so important in the whole American narrative and how it reflects itself today. So please join us for the concluding episode of, on this series of Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.